Welcome to the Rewilded Human Podcast, where Dr. Lucille and Lynn will tackle your most difficult and intimate questions with candor, tough love, and a little dash of humor. In today's episode, vicious cycle of poor metabolic health, high cortisol, high stress, poor food decisions, lack of exercise, lack of sleep, right? And then it compounds that underlying mental health predisposition that most of us have. It's just a matter of how much do we stabilize all these other factors to keep it from manifesting. Helping them understand the connection between inflammatory foods and inflammatory emotions or thoughts. We need stable blood sugar. And so stable blood sugar allows us to be stable. Welcome, everybody, to the Rewilded Human Podcast. I'm Dr. Lucille, holistic psychiatrist and psychotherapist, and this is my partner in crime, Lynn Hardy, mastermind behind our podcast, and also a a naturopath and a nutritionist. And today we have a really special treat for you all because we have a special guest, Dr. Diane Grice. And Dr. Diane is going to talk to us about healing deep emotional wounds, integrating homeopathy and acupuncture for mind-body wellness. So Dr. Diane has a really well-rounded background in, uh, you know, the healing arts. So she's a naturopath, acupuncturist, homeopath. Have I left anything out, Diane? No, that's, that's, that's the gist okay. of it. Yes, thank you. And uh, one thing that really drew me to her on Instagram was uh, her interest in bridging spirituality and science. And she also has a deep passion for suicide prevention and uh, grief recovery. First of all, if we could just do a basic round of definitions, Diane, because some of our listeners may not be all that aware of, you know, the modalities outside of mainstream medicine. So I wondered if you could give us kind of, you know, brief description, what is naturopathy, what's homeopathy, and what's acupuncture? Yes, of course. Um, Well, naturopathy is uh, kind of an umbrella term, just encompassing natural medical kinds of approaches. So this would include dietary changes, uh, herbal recommendations, exercise recommendations, all of those sorts of lifestyle and um, natural medicine modalities. And within that, there is a doctorate program, a four-year medical program that is to allow for people who want to really take it as far as they can to get a doctorate in naturopathic medicine. And so this allows for the ability to prescribe, which is really nice. And every country is a little bit different as far as regulations. But here in the United States, it allows us to have a DEA number to be able to prescribe um, hormone replacement therapy, which is really helpful. Then part of that, we all practice a little bit differently. So for within naturopathic medicine, some people focus in sports medicine, other people focus in more of aesthetics medicine. For me, I focus mostly in mental health. Great. And, okay. Yes. And so homeopathy is one of the modalities that's used in naturopathic medicine. It's a way to um, use natural substances to stimulate the body's natural he- healing response. And so it's um, using things like uh, salt and anything from salt, which is um, natrum muriaticum, which we'll, we will talk about here coming up in regards to grief, and all the way to things like um, snake venom, uh, lachesis muta, which is uh, used for a lot of um, menopausal symptoms, hot flashes and irritability. And so all natural substances create a response in the human body. And so we match the person's symptoms to something in nature that would present a very similar picture. And in a very very dilute amount, it kind of matches the the frequency of the imbalance and helps to correct it. And so not all naturopathic doctors use homeopathy. They're all trained in it and some take it or leave it. Uh, Just like some of us take or leave injection medicine and IV therapies. We all kind of do the things that we're um, just, you know, more in alignment with. 
Um, so for me personally, homeopathy is more of that energetic kind of medicine. And then acupuncture is the other kind of uh, energetic, uh, we call it a V stimulating, stimulating the self-healing correct, uh, corrective mechanism that's inside the person. And so I like to use homeopathy and acupuncture. So acupuncture is using uh, needles to help move the energy throughout the system. And um, we can use different points to help with grief, different points to help with anger, uh, different points to help with digestion or hot flashes. And so it's a way of using, uh, working with the energetic uh, system of the body. And that also very much impacts the spiritual system as well. Oh, wow. That was and, uh, an excellent, excellent review of, of the three. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Diane. One of the things... Uh, that also struck me was your uh, focus on suicide prevention. And I think suicide is a topic that is just so still not spoken of. People are still not aware of it. It's it's a challenge even to the most seasoned uh, you know, mental health practitioner. And so I wanted, if, if you're willing to talk a little bit about your origin story, uh, how you got into you know, focusing on suicide prevention. Yes, of course. Um, so I was interested in medicine in general since I was maybe five or six, just interested in cuts and bruises and different things. So I was already curious about the human body and how it can heal. Um, from a very, very young age. But then uh, when I was 14, I had a, a, a huge loss and that really set my path for me. I, my, my father passed from suicide when I was 14. Um, he was so 45 sorry. years old. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, it, it's yeah. absolutely just, um, yeah, it was, it was a tr very tragic loss for our family, for his friends, for his coworkers, um, really our whole community. We're from a small town in Southern Indiana. Everyone knew each other. It was in 2001, which is, you know, when really, I mean, now it's starting to be talked about a little bit more, but back then it really was not discussed at all. And, um, so, you know, I, I was 14, I was too young to really grapple with it. But um, I over the years, I, you know, moved into pre med and um, continued into the natural medicine route, because I didn't want to only have prescription medications as my tool in my toolbox. Um, my dad had been put on an antidepressant a few weeks before his suicide. And that's something that I remember, you know, getting on my big computer, desktop computer at home and searching the name of the medicine he had been put on and seeing so many forums back in the day, those, uh, you know, the old blogs that uh, so many families saying that they had lost their loved ones to suicide. And within a few years, the packaging labels for SSRIs required the, you know, the insert that it can increase suicidality. But at that point, it wasn't well known or understood or talked about even with clinicians. And so you know, um, my father's primary care provider, who the doctor we had been going to our whole lives, and he had known dad so well. Um, I can only imagine how that impacted him and his practice, you know, and just that that knowledge of how the treatment can worsen the symptomology. It was just um, hard for my young brain to wrap itself around. And then as I learned more and more going through school and um, and then working with patients now who are on a lot of you know antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications and they're um, sometimes getting worse or they're they're developing you know just more numbing where they're not really able to heal the wound. They're not yeah. able to really feel the wound. And it, yeah. so it kind of brushes it under the rug in a way that lets it kind of fester. And that's what I think, you know, my dad um, had some childhood trauma that was at the root of his depression. And if he had the right therapist, you know, I, of course, I, I grapple with what ifs, um, which I do a lot less of now, but for the first decade or two, um, I really struggled with, you know, the possible treatments that could have saved him and really good talk therapy and EMDR and helping him heal that trauma from childhood. Um, but it, it would have required his 
willingness to be vulnerable. And I don't know if he was healthy enough to be vulnerable because vulnerability takes mental health. And he was not in a metabolically healthy place. He was very stressed. He was overweight, right? And this vicious cycle of poor metabolic health, high cortisol, high stress, poor food decisions, lack of exercise, lack of sleep, right? And then it compounds that underlying mental health predisposition that most of us have. It's just a matter of how much do we stabilize all these other factors to keep it from manifesting. And for him, um, I don't know if he, you know, was, would have been able to really uh, address that wound. But I, my hope now is that I can help people try to um, be willing to be vulnerable, be healthy enough to a be able to be vulnerable and work with their therapist, work with their, you know, um, spiritual, you know, facilitators, whether it's at church or, or elsewhere to, to really get to the root. And we need a strong enough vessel to allow our mind and spirit to go to those really um, difficult, scary places that, most of us, that's where the healing really lies. And, um, but we need this structure stable enough to let our mind and spirit go there. And so for him, he needed a lot of different support that he wasn't getting. And therefore the medicine wasn't enough, you know, and, and for some medication can be a wonderful tool along this path to healing. Yeah. So I'm not saying it's not a good tool, but it's just that it needs to be one piece of the puzzle. And for him, it was the main, it was really the only piece of support that he, he really had at the time. So now my passion and purpose is to try to help other people who are feeling suicidally depressed, ideally working with people who are not even to that point yet. And, you know, working on um, hormonal imbalance and high stress and poor life balance and things that if yes. they do nothing, they'll get to that more serious state. Um, but also with people that have had a lot of grief, it has taken me a long time to get to the place where I feel like I can really help. I had to do a lot of my own healing and a lot of my own growing and um, get to the place where I could have this conversation without tearing up, uh, you know, and, and so it's part of me just needing to feel like I have my vessel strong enough to be able to hold space for people who are dealing with a situation that at one point would have been too triggering for me to be able to help hold a healthy kind of space for them. And so um, now I've, I'm not fully to my place of healing, of course, but I feel like I'm far enough on the path that I can help guide others who have lost um, loved ones to suicide or just experiencing really traumatic grief or childhood wounds that are impacting them still in their adult life. Diane, do you find that in the last four years, you know, since the pandemic and everything that a lot more people are depressed or contemplating suicide or have committed suicide, have things changed a lot in your practice? What What are you seeing? Yes, I'm seeing a lot more. Um, the rates are up and um, specifically in um, adolescents and young adults. I believe wow. it's now the second leading cause of death for like 15 to 20. So, I mean, it is really really increased and not it's it's tricky it's the the individuals these these young you know adolescents teens uh, young adults but also them seeing their parents stress and their grandparents stress and so it's this multi-generational kind of imbalance that we have seen over the last four years and there's a big piece that's financial stress yeah. And so that's an interesting part of medicine. We don't, in psychiatry, we don't necessarily acknowledge a whole lot, but financial insecurity is a huge source of stress for people. And so I want to give that some, you know, airtime and credit as a, as a source of, um, of needing to be really acknowledged and understood and, and for people to really take that piece of their life very seriously as a, a, a place where they could create some stability and foundation to heal and grow. Because without that kind of um, stability, there is this constant worry. And um, whether it's, you know, during the pandemic, acute years, you know, 20 and 21, 
um, it was a lot of stress about health and, and, but also finances, but in these last year or two, I'd say 23, 24 financial stress is now outweighing the concern about health, you know, and that's where we're really stuck now is people not, um, in a position where they can take time for themselves and they're overworking and not sleeping enough and things like that, or not going to the doctor, not going to their therapist, you know, not paying for their medications or supplements that they really need to help keep their foundation strong. Um, yeah, I think the statistics have shifted so much now because uh, they, there used to be, as you know, this U-shaped curve where it was the younger folk and the elderly or older than middle-aged who had the highest levels of happiness in our societies. Mm -hmm. And it was the middle-aged who had the lowest levels. And so what happened is the one side of that U-shaped curve has dropped off. So the younger folk, uh, the ones that you're just talking about, they're the ones who are actually more depressed, more unhappy. They're no longer uh, even propping up that that U-shaped curve. So now we have it's mostly the elderly in our societies that are the happiest. Mm -hmm. And I think that bodes really uh, poorly for, you know, what's, what's going to happen in, in the future years if we've got a whole group of young people who are already demoralized and you know, unhappy and struggling with their mental health. Um, I, you know, I, I very, very concerned about what's going to happen to the, to our society. Yeah. And I think because the future is so uncertain, like it's never been this bad. Yeah. And never, never and like, you, like Diane, like you mentioned the prices and, you know, the financial uncertainty, everything's doubled, tripled, quadrupled in the last couple of years. And people are barely surviving. You can barely put food on the table. And then, you know, for the young people, it's like looking into the future, they will be replaced by robots soon, right? Well, like, what kind of profession do you even train for? Like, what kind of jobs are we going to have in 20 years time? <laughs> Most of the jobs will disappear. So I, I see this with my son as well. He's 27 next month. So how do you even look into the future? What, what are you going to do? What are you planning for? Should you even have children in this world? So they're, I think they're dealing with a lot of issues that we never had to deal with when we were young. Do you find that, Diane? that these kinds oh, of yes. issues are coming up. Yes, and housing. I mean, I have yeah. lots of patients talking about housing, whether uh, all ages where rent increase and in, in mortgage rates and um, you know, people wanting to you know, start new somewhere. It's really hard to um, relocate because of yeah. the financial, you know, the, the cost of living. And so, but yes, healthy food choices and um, gym memberships, like things are going to fall to the side that really are, should be non-negotiable. But when you don't have an option, something's going to give and, you know, you're going to pay for childcare instead of the organic food or the, the, healthy protein, you know? And so yeah. I understand why people, um, you know, are spacing out their therapy appointments, but I also really see how their lack of consistency, whether it's with healthy food or stress, you know, stress uh, management um, is likely impacting their inability to kind of shift the situation you know it's like this vicious cycle where yeah. we need that healthy um, mind and body to be able to make a move in a positive direction whether it's with our job with our relationships um, things like that and um, when we're overwhelmed and overworked we just we let things be that probably shouldn't be and that's something else that I talk about a lot with my patients is you know healthy work life healthy home life um having healthy, honest conversations with people, but instead of addressing things head on, if you're, if your gas tank's empty, you don't have the energy to, to have that conversation. So yeah. then it stays in your head and it festers and it causes internal stress. And so that's where we have to be really honest with ourselves about the cost of not taking action. You know, there's a cost and energy expenditure of, taking action, but there's also an energy expenditure of not taking action and really trying to be clear and honest with ourselves about that. And so um, asking honest questions and um, encouraging journaling and reflection and things like that, because we all have our answers inside. It's just a matter of 
giving the time and the space and the stillness to tap into that. And so making the time to be honest with yourself and having somebody who's willing to kind of ask open-ended challenging questions to get you to really think, um, which is where therapy often comes in, where it, it having that, that neutral person to um, challenge perspective and um, allow us to reframe. It's really hard to do it for yourself. Um, journaling is one way to kind of get you there, but even better would be journaling and having a licensed professional to talk through things. And so I really believe that every human walking this earth should have a therapist that they see regularly. Um, but that's just not possible financially, um, even with insurance, you know, and there's a lot of people have good insurance and you know many therapists are not taking on new clients or they're they're booked out for months and months and so um a lot of people just aren't getting the support that they really need and um what would you recommend for these people? lots of areas what would you recommend for the people who cannot afford to see a therapist on a regular basis are there things they can do at home you know to manage stress and their mental health and as far as suicide prevention, like, for example, if you have someone in your family or a friend, what what tools can you use to help them? Yes. Yeah, so I would I would be talking about the other foundational pieces. And so focusing on nutrition, having really being helping them understand the connection between inflammatory foods and inflammatory emotions or thoughts. And if we can really choose foods that are going to be nutritive and calming and support amino acid production, aka proteins and Protein, having yes. neuro neurotransmitter support, it's, yes. we need stable blood sugar. And yes. so stable blood sugar allows us to be stable. And so I work with a lot of people with anxiety. And, and of course, people who have lost loved ones, um, there's a lot of anxiety and fear often for the people around them. So they it is very common when you've lost someone to suicide to fear that anything you say or do is going to cause someone to do this. And it's just this, our way our brain tries to grapple and reason with something that we isn't reasonable, but it, we trying. And so this fear and this kind of walking on eggshells is really common for up to, you know, couple of years, even for some people, but certainly within the first, you know, months after, after this kind of loss. And so creating stability in their system, grounding in their system is high protein and throughout the day. And so eating protein uh -huh. literally grounds you into your body so that you're not just in your thoughts. And so whether it's anxious thoughts or depressive thoughts, Protein is really, really helpful for that. The other thing is, is movement. And often um, when there is depression, there's often um, anger there, whether it's, for many, it's unexpressed. Um, but the root of many people's depression is anger. For, for a lot, for men, they're a little more willing to accept that and honor that and maybe even act on it, whether they yell or, or lifting weights or just getting it out. Women, um, for a lot of women, it's harder to identify and honor anger. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I talk with a lot of women about that um, if they if they resonate with this, then um, bringing out, um, you know, whether it's punching pillows or using the voice, um, singing loudly, um, yelling, um, you know, safely, <laughs> safely releasing the anger, yeah. um, even writing letters and um, tearing it up or burning it is really very cathartic. Um, yeah. Safely outside, of course, yes, have a so tent to throw it in, uh, some water around to make sure you don't cause damage, but um, just a really Le releasing the emotion is really, really important um, safely. And so giving ideas, um, whether it's even just running, lifting, it, all these things are, once again, how do we get someone out of their mind into their body? 
So exercise, dance, actually a study came out recently looking at the SSR, the uh, antidepressants and exercise and dance, dancing beat every form of exercise beat this SSRIs was the most therapeutic antidepressant is dancing. And so Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be with anyone else. Just put on music you love, um, you know, whether you're cleaning or you're clothed or not, whatever, just dance, you know, and um, so really everyone has different things that they're going to resonate with. And so I like to have conversations about the broad way that you can move the broad ways that you can um, connect with other people, whether it's volunteering or spiritual groups or calling up a friend that you've been thinking about, but you think they don't have time for you, um, things like that. And so I, when people bring up um, cha- uh, responses to ideas, I might challenge it and tell me more about that. How, how is this something that this person has said to you that they don't want to speak to you? Or is it something you've told yourself about them, you know, and that a lot of times, um, especially if we're feeling depressed, if we feel like a burden, that is one of the lowest um, vibrational kinds of emotional states is feeling like a burden, feeling shame. Um, and a lot of people who have lost ones to suicide, they have, they have some sense of blame towards themselves of not having done something. If there was something maybe I could have done or said to have prevented that. And so the people left are often um, really challenged by shame, guilt, Um, feeling like they're burdening their loved ones, their coworkers, you know, that they should have gotten over it after a year or five years or 10 years. And um, so really honoring the, um, the normalcy of this, but also challenging the usefulness of that emotion and um, really trying to give the power back to the individual and the power back to their friends and their family and encouraging them to let that person decide for themselves. You're deciding for them whether they want to talk to you or not, whether they want to go on a hike with you or not, whether they want to go to lunch with you or not, if you're assuming they're going to say no or that they don't have time. But I wonder what it would be like if you were to invite them to lunch. Maybe they've been wanting connection as well and it's actually giving them an opportunity for healing and connection that they really need um, as well as you really need and so the reminder of how good it feels to help another person sometimes people need that reminder to allow other people in to help them um, because they've convinced themselves they don't deserve it or they're too much or whatever it might be and so a lot of my conversation is trying to tease that out and find truth and not truth in that and um, and maybe even in that session um, encouraging them to send a text message over to connect or to put it in their calendar when they're going to go to that workout class or that yoga class you know and just um, need Needing that encouragement to take some action um, because when we're stuck inside our thoughts, we can really just tread water and we're not making any progress. So um, those are a couple of areas that I would likely explore with people and just find what unique um, avenue is going to be um, the best for them. We call it shared decision making where we kind of look at all the options and yeah. together we figure out what the plan is going to be. Love that. That's wonderful. Um, One of the things that I find, too, is that once there has been a suicide, unfortunately, people have no idea, especially within the family system, they really have no idea how to handle it. Uh, And often, and um, just to reveal something about myself, uh, my father committed suicide. I was fortunately older. I don't know how devastating it would have been if I'd been your age 14. Yeah, it was so it was uh, devastating that. enough when I was I I was in my thirties at the time. My mother and I never talked about it mm-hmm. in any direct way, which was a I think a, a big mistake. And I know that uh, you know from my clients that's all often what happens is that people just don't talk about it once it's happened. And they they go into their own little private worlds, as you say, and. And they create all sorts of stories and they go into their shame and guilt and self-blame and all of that. And they they miss the potential for the healing connection 
but, but people are just so, uh, I think, in many ways, traumatized. And nobody, how, nobody is prepared uh, for how to deal with this in a healthy way. So I was just wondering, you know, what, if you're dealing especially with more than one person in a family system, you know, how do you help them start connecting after there have there has been a suicide in the family? Yeah, well, first, I'm really sorry that we we share this trauma at, at any our, age. Our father died at the same in the same year. You said 2001. That yeah. was the year my father also committed suicide. Oh my yeah. goodness. Oh, I'm so sorry. It really is the any death is so traumatic, but the way that it allows the survivors to create dialogue is unique. You know, a car accident or a heart attack is pretty a clear line of events and um, and an outcome. And with suicide, it there's so much left unknown as to really why. Even if there's a letter, there's still so many unknowns. And that's where that's why as humans, I think we're our minds and hearts are designed to make sense of it, just to create a story, um, to make some sort of, um, uh, you know, justification for it if we can. And so um, it's just, it really does keep a, a lot of us from, um, from really, yes, connecting with our own families even, but certainly with other people too. Um, so as far as the story, the story breakdown, one route I like to encourage if, and, you know, I know that, um, Lynn, you had asked about, you know, if people can't afford therapy, um, even in, in this situation, um, very much would encourage therapy, but if that isn't available, um, I love cognitive behavioral therapy, and there are many CBT workbooks that are online that you can find that can help you when there are, um, this, this distorted thinking, um, you know, these all or nuns and these um, these narratives that we have um, about what has occurred. So using these workbooks to help kind of tease out the story, the truths and untruths, the root cause, the, the root feelings, things like that can just help people um, break through the emotion to more of the um, the facts of, of the situation. And so this for some people is really, really helpful. Um, so I, I very much encourage that kind of um, analysis. Um, the other piece is the way that I, the way I approach it is I'm likely seeing one person, right? One, one individual. So if, you know, if I had Lucille, had, if I had you in my office, I could try to support your system and coming to more, coming to terms with the, the grief, um, feeling and processing the grief in a way that you yourself is going to have, um, a, hopefully a deeper healing experience. Now, I can't treat your your aunt or your your sister if they're not in the room. But what happens is that when one family member is willing to be more vulnerable, is willing to go a little deeper, is able to heal and find forgiveness for themselves, forgiveness for the one who has passed, um, having some sense of um, of peace that has come to the surface that spills over onto everyone around and that invites everyone else to explore that same healing for themselves. And so um, the tools I will use would be acupuncture, homeopathy, these energetic kinds of medicines that um, I mentioned salt, homeopathic salt, natrum muriaticum is one of the most common remedies for unresolved grief mm -hmm. that is long standing. Um, people who likely respond to Nat Muir have um, often a, a, an aversion to crying in front of other people, or they even feel like they need to cry and they can't cry anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, it's literally the grief is pushed in and um, it often shows up with, you know, like high, high blood pressure or heart irregularities, cold sores, just signs that the system's under stress in different kinds of ways. And um, so I'll base their physical symptoms and this mental emotional state if they have this kind of unique 
picture of their unresolved grief using nat mirror often people are crying more freely they are sleeping deeper they're not dwelling about on the past um people who need nat mirror often have a lot of um dwelling on the disappointment of the past so reliving the days leading up to the suicide the um the aftermath and you know just there even 10 20 30 years later going back and back and back and that's interrupting their sleep it's interrupting their daytime peace and so using homeopathic natrum muriaticum it will help calm that state to where they're more present. They're not going back to the past all the time. Mm -hmm. Trying to bring yourself present when your subconscious is always going back, that takes energy and effort. And so they're wasting their energy trying to bring themselves to the present, trying to care about their current life. And so when they don't have to exert that energy to be present, they're just more at ease. They have more energy to do what's in front of them now. And so um, I find that when I treat one person, their family often um, starts to, you know, be more maybe willing to t go to into therapy or they're, they're eating meals together and they're, they're, so it really does spill into everyone else around you. And so I think it's just a good reminder for all of us that if we heal ourselves and get ourselves emotionally more open and um, then we're able to connect more. And so everyone around us gets to benefit from us being in a more harmonious, um, happy kind of um, uh, peaceful place because we can help the people who aren't quite there um, connect in with that frequency. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that so much. And, and right. what people don't realize is that this emotional burden that we carry with us, emotion, ev eventually it will manifest into physical illnesses. And it's so yeah. important to address it before that happens. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is exactly what, what you're doing in your practice. And it, this is so important for people to realize this, that you, you can keep sweeping stuff under the rug, but you can only do that for so long. Yes, like and you said you about can... high blood pressure and mm -hmm. heart issues and all of those things. And I mean, so many different things. Basically, everything can be tied back to stress and unreleased trauma, emotional issues that we're carrying. Do you see a characteristic group of symptoms that people, that you've mentioned, as Lynn said, the increased blood pressure, et cetera. But is, do you see that there is a constellation of symptoms that people show up with when they have unresolved grief? Is it common in most people to show up with the same symptoms or does it differ from person to person? Very good question. Um, I so quick answer is it differs. Um, the the natrum mirror picture emotionally they yeah have difficulty crying, um, but there's often a lot of anger and bitterness and hatred towards those that have wronged them. I've taken nat mirror myself. Um, I've I've taken um, you know staphysagria, which is a different homeopathic remedy where there's a lot of injustice. It's not hatred. It's it's unfairness, which there's a, it's very reasonable to feel like it's unfair when your loved one has, has, has died by suicide. Um, there's so much sense of injustice. And so e each person, even that had the same trauma, um, you know, losing a loved one to suicide, one will present with the anger and hatred towards that person or towards someone else around it or towards themselves. Um, another will present with, um, with a loneliness and a feeling of being forsaken. Um, they need pulsatilla. Uh, instead of not being able to cry, they're weeping constantly. They're weeping while talking with you about what has happened. Um, they don't want to be left alone. They want to be cuddled and consoled, whereas natural mirror, they push people away, they don't want to hug. And so my job is to understand the way that their system has shifted after that trauma. And so um, there is, there's oh, maybe five to 10 remedies that are commonly used in this kind of post grief, uh, post trauma state. Um, aconite is one for more of the acute phase when they're kind of in shock. When you're in shock, you're you're restless, you can't sleep, you have a lot of fear of death of your own death. Um, and so there, there's a handful of patterns that people tend to shift into a unique pattern. Um, and so 
there's a cluster of symptoms that tend to occur. So some people will um, have a decrease in appetite. Others have a dramatic increase in appetite. Just like, you know, with depression, the criteria, a significant change in weight. Some of us gain 30 pounds. Others of us will lose 30 pounds when we're clinically depressed, right? And so each person's physical response is is going to be unique. Some will have constipation, others will have diarrhea. Some will be sleeping 12 to 14 hours a day, others are sleeping two to four hours a night. And so um, each person's system kind of um, has a unique way that it gets off balance. But what's interesting is, as a human, we have a we each individual tends to have a unique, we call it a constitution where when I'm stressed, I have a tendency to have a lot of bloating or diarrhea before, you know, stressful events or stressful meetings. Whereas another person, they always tend to have heart palpitations and reflux um, whenever they're really nervous. And so we, our systems tend to have a general kind of um, cluster of symptoms that when it's not in balance, it goes off in this unique way. And so this kind of trauma can push us into this old pattern, or it might push us into something new and unique that um, we've never really experienced symptoms like it. Um, So it's, it's, oh, it's very unique to the person, but homeopathy has a, there's everything in nature has its own um, signature imprint as to how it tends to cause a change in symptoms. And so there are options for any kind of picture. And so that's what makes it um, helpful is that there is um, there are treatments that can fit whatever specific cluster of symptoms that unique the individual in front of you has. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's five to 10 that are the most common. And I'd say 80, 90% of people need one of those five remedies um, um, because they're, they're just really common post grief, post shock remedies. Would you recommend that people just go to the pharmacy and try these remedies themselves? Or would you, would you suggest that somebody goes and has a proper consultation to find out the right remedy for them? So I would say that it, ideally you will consult with someone because there are, there's so much overlap of symptoms. Some of them have the waking from two to 3 a.m. Um, and like, you know, five five different remedies might have that. And so really um, working with somebody that's been doing it for a while, they can match it most accurately. Yeah. Um, I would say if you don't have those resources and you're reading, you know, online blogs and things um, describing these symptoms in detail so that you can really really match yourself to that remedy um, versus, um, you know, one or two symptoms, then yeah. it's safer and more likely like that you'll have a good match. Um, yeah. But I tend to dose even less than what the bottle says for mm-hmm. everything, for supplements, yeah. for medicines, and for homeopathic. So yeah. the boron tube, say five pellets, five times a day, yeah. I never have people dose that way. Um, so if any listener was wanting to explore some of these medicines, yeah. I would start with two pellets every other day. So just really wow, slowly that low. Okay, that's a very bringing low it dose. in. Yes. Yeah. Um, and sometimes even two pellets every other day is too much. And I have people put two pellets in a couple ounces of water, stir the water, let it sit for 15 minutes, and then drink it. And so water dosing is a way to make it even more gentle. More diluted, so yeah. wow. when in doubt, take less Mm -hmm. (laughs) or don't take it, take it once a week and slowly, um, see if your, if your mood is shifting, but really, um, like anything in medicine, having professional guidance is super helpful. Um, and usually with homeopathy, once you've found your remedy and your constitutional remedy, it's often not something that changes super frequently. The dosing and the potency might change some, but um, once you've once you have the right medicine, it's something where you might need to follow up. You know, every you know, six to eight weeks. So it's not something where it typically will change every week or two weeks. Um, yeah. And so the follow up can be kind of spaced out, but having that professional guidance is definitely helpful because the wrong medicine, although it is dilute and energetic, it can stir the pot. And if you're already, if you're having panic attacks or you're having suicidal mm-hmm. thoughts, having those get stirred up and made worse 
by mm-hmm. taking the wrong remedy or taking too much of the right remedy, yeah. even that can stir things up. That could push you into a dangerous place. And so that's where professional guidance is really important um, to make sure that you're you're not made worse. Our, our job as doctors is first do no harm. And so you don't want to do harm by not having supervision. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. And I like that that whole uh, piece about how you dose because it's it's I think always the case often I shouldn't say always often the case that less is more. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think that that idea of, of starting very slow and low is really the best policy. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, That's and especially nice. when we're talking about unresolved grief, the way I think of it is your, your mind and spirit pushed all this into a closet, tucked it away because it didn't feel like it was safe to really address. And so I take it as a spiritual contract when a person shows up, reaches out to me and says, I'm, I need to start working on this, whether they're 30 years old or they're 85 years old. And I've had people in their eighties come that are ready to start dealing with their childhood trauma. Wow. You know, there's, it's never too late. I yeah. think is the first point It's never too late, but if they're willing to come and they feel like they need to go here, I trust their spirit. I trust them that they are ready. Um, and I also trust that if they had tried to do it before they were ready, if someone forced them to go, it probably wouldn't work so well. Um, that our spirits, our minds, our bodies are um, keeping us safe as, as a foundation. And so, however, sometimes that brushing things and compartmentalizing, pushing all this grief into the closet, it has a purpose and a helpfulness for a period of time and then it starts to cause trouble and it's no longer helpful and it's actually can become harmful so now we need to slowly bring this stuff out of the closet to be addressed to be felt to be witnessed to be acknowledged to be um, processed mentally physically emotionally and so that's what I think about when I think of someone taking that mirror five pellets, five times a day for Mm -hmm. every day for two weeks, they will likely feel much, much worse Mm -hmm. because it's bringing all that grief and sadness and disappointment out so quickly that it's too fast for the mind to process for the spirit, the physically, the physical heart to process. Even I really want to take it slow when we're dealing with this old grief, old sadness, old disappointment, um, injustice, all embarrassment, all these old emotional wounds that many of us are holding on to from childhood. And so we want to address it, but but slow and steady so that it can be digested and processed and not cause more um, imbalance. Um, too fast is it's like trying to drink from a fire hose. It's not going to work. And so we want it to be sustained um, sustainable and not wreck havoc in their personal lives too, you know? Um, so it's really important to have that, um, that respect for the medicine and respect for the, the person that you're working with that they didn't get here overnight. They're not going to heal overnight. And me trying to go too fast is not honoring the system. And it's, um, it's not setting them up for success either. It's tricky with healing. Sometimes we want to get so quick and gung ho and we just want to like bulldoze straight ahead. Um, Whether it's exercise or diet, people can take it anything too far. Um, And we really have to honor our, our system as a whole and take it slow and steady and consistency. That's the big thing. Um, So we can't, we can't open up the floodgates um, to our past trauma and expect ourselves to be able to, you know, um, keep up with our day-to-day lives. So a little bit at a time um, really allows people to, to come to peace with it in a, in a more sustainable way. I used to dose more traditionally of daily or a couple times a day. Um, and what I was seeing was aggravations, people getting worse. And, and so it's stressful for the patient. It's also stressful as a practitioner because yeah. you're 
dealing with this practice management, right? Of am mm -hmm. I, did I give the right thing? Is it the dosage? And so over the last 11 years, I just backed off more, more, more. And I'm seeing that people are needing my help less and they're, because they're not blooding themselves with all this old stuff as much as, you know, I, I used to think that it was necessary to do. So I've, I've changed my practice as I've, um, as I've witnessed this with many people over the years. Oh, that's very wise. And the other thing I think that I've noticed, and I wonder if you've noticed it too, <laughs> is that people, maybe they have one unresolved grief that they're coming for specifically, or some unresolved trauma, whatever it may be that's that, that's occurred to them, like a motor vehicle accident, or, you know, a loved one, um, you know, dying from natural causes or whatever. And what they don't realize often is, you know, it's not just healing that one incident. It's about all the previous incidents in their lives where something similar happened. And because it's kind of got, you know, it, it feels like it's been healed, that it does it's not there on the surface. They don't even think about it daily. People don't understand that there's a, it's like a chain link sometimes that the 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 more recent trauma or loss or whatever it is is backed up by a whole bunch of other stuff that's occurred over life. I mean, you can't get out of this world without being traumatized multiple times. My feeling is, yeah. So I think that's another reason why you have to go slow and you cannot build any expectation that, wow, it's just, if once I get through this smooth sailing for the rest of my life, you know, so I want to get it done and get it done now. You know, it, it mm -hmm. does, I've, I've almost never seen it work that way. Have you, have you had that experience as well? Oh, yes. Um, where there's, yes, the current wound is, um, I think of it like uh, salt and a deep old wound. It's it's irritating this wound that was already there, and so it feels like that's the irritant. But we need to there. It's it goes further than that, and so I I love rec referring to it for EMDR. I, it's a similar way of just working on that old filing cabinet of of um, traumas and emotion and how it it goes back. It's always connected further than what we, we can even consciously remember. And so, yes, I think that that's a big part of it for a lot of people that it's, it's deeper than what we even know exactly. at that moment. But yeah. as we do, as we heal this more, we th talk about it like an onion where we're, we have layers to us and these, we, we can treat this most outer wound, which when that level, that layer peels off. So for some people there, then the nat mirror state, let's say is, is an, an outer wound. And, um, underneath when we peel that off, there's a different layer, a different kind of emotional state that was preceding this current trauma. And so sometimes we kind of will have to change course once we go deeper and we've healed this kind of uh, hatred or bitterness. And underneath that is the loneliness and the feeling forsaken. And so now their physical symptoms are changing. Now their emotional symptoms are kind of coming up and they're talking about feeling lonely versus wanting to be left alone. Mm -hmm. And so now I need to change as they change. I need to shift them maybe from Nat Mirror over to Pulsatilla because now they're weeping and they're feeling lonely and they're, you know, don't have an appetite. They don't have thirst. So I will look at their whole state and try to change as they change. And then once that layer peels off, maybe we go into uh, a fear state where there's all this fear and anxiety that they used to have when they were a teenager. And now we're kind of digging layer by layer, kind of deeper, deeper, deeper into the system. And so uh, with both uh, homeopathy, but also acupuncture, you know, I think that um, working on that energetic system, it, it does get the spiritual system more in balance, but also mental, emotionally. And people will be, when you start putting needles in, they will start talking about stuff that they, they will, I've heard it so many times. Why am I even talking about this right now? And I say, it's just energy moving. Whatever's coming up needs to be said. And I've had people talk about old childhood 
things that have happened and the way their father spoke to them and, and, and tearing up on the table when they aren't sure why it's there or why it's important. But, and I don't know, all I, all I say is I invite it. Anything that comes up is invited, the tears, the laughter, um, the, the conversation. And it's interesting as you get healthier, as your body is more in that parasympathetic state, it can see things with more clarity. And so there's often a sense of understanding that can come from using these types of modalities. I think of therapy, mind body medicine is also a way of, of self healing, right? Where if people's perspectives can shift the way they see themselves, the way they see their story can be in a healthier place. It has a dramatic impact on, on their, their overall health and um, allows them to have that, that clarity and peace that then can let them go deeper and deeper and deeper into their healing. But we have to get out of this um, fight or flight state, which most people with this kind of loss are in. Of course, you're, you're fearful of yourself, the people around you. And so shifting you out of sympathetic into parasympathetic is a big part of my job um, and their job, you know, and I try to teach them tools that can help them. It's all about getting into the body. Once again, we, so many of us are, we're bottlenecked. We just live in our heads. Yeah. Uh, we don't, we can't even feel our feet. I, I like to ask that question. Are you able to feel your feet on the floor? Um, so many people, they can't even connect with their body mentally. And so it's that awareness that they don't have that connection is kind of alarming for a lot of people. And so it, we, you know, there's lots of tools we can do grounding techniques, getting your bare, bare feet on the ground. Um, one of my big favorite ways of connecting, but also mineral status, making sure their electrolytes are high enough. They have salt, yeah. their cells can communicate with each other. Um, so many people that are struggling with mental health, they aren't making proper hydration and food choices, uh, partly out of a narrative that they don't deserve the effort or they don't deserve the nourishment, or it's often, these aren't conscious thoughts. They're, they're subconscious, but there's a, it takes effort to go to the grocery store, to prepare food, to yeah. cook food, to clean up after. And so this, whether it's the fatigue that's driving the poor decision-making, the poor decision-making that drives the fatigue, it's just this yeah. vicious cycle. And so if we can intervene with nutrition, intervene with electrolytes and grounding techniques, just simple tools that help people feel like they have a foundation, then they, then we can make some movement. But until you have a, a stable vessel where you're stuck, you can't make much movement if you're just right here. Um, and so I think that we can really emphasize these, um, you know, lifestyle tools that just allow you to be in your body enough that you can deal with your mind and your spirit. You have some of us, we all start in different places. <laughs> some of us are really mentally and spiritually strong and not physically strong. Others are very physically strong and not very emotionally or spiritually strong, right? And so we have to see what is going to, what's needed for that individual and acknowledging that if we address one part of the, the triad, the other two will have better likelihood of success so yeah. we can meet anybody where they're at and we can meet ourselves with compassion wherever we're at you know that we we're all on this journey towards healing and we're all in very different places and we have had all very different experiences so we need to be find gentleness and compassion for ourselves and when we have that we can find humor we can find you know some levity in life um, but a lot of us are so hard on ourselves and we're so critical and that's where you know as far as the big the big buzzword in a lot of uh, social media this cortisol 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 mm -hmm. and stress 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 which is yeah. good i'm glad it's being talked about yeah um, and sometimes the high stress is things outside of us, but for most of us, the vast majority of our stress uh, source is right here. Yeah. Right. And this mind can make or break our experience and dictate the relationships that we're in, the relationships we uh, we are willing to stand. Yeah. Um, and so it's really important that we acknowledge and we work on 
the this uh, between our ears area that is it's so easy to want to focus everywhere else <laughs> but if we can get our mindset and our um, our physical body in a place where our mindset can be stable and grounded then we're able to just make so much better choices for ourselves and therefore have more of an impact in our lives, which is what we're here for. You know, we're here to be vibrant, to be loving, to be engaged. And for so many people who have dealt with loss, we become reclusive and isolated and we um, get smaller, smaller, smaller instead of bigger and brighter. Mm -hmm. And it's normal and part of the process to have that period of smallness, of grief, of isolation, perhaps. But letting it persist for months, years, decades, that's where we get into trouble. So we need to really let ourselves grieve, but we also really have to allow ourselves to feel joy and, and connection. And often if we're in that really dark place, we need someone from the outside to help bring us out of it. And so that's where that willingness to connect, whether it's on a free Facebook group, um, or whether it's through a paid, um, you know, therapist or, or naturopath uh, or nutrition kind of uh, consultation, but letting someone from the outside, whether it's free or paid, let someone in on what's going on and let yourself be seen. We yeah. have to be seen. And, um, you know, for the suicide loss, there's a, there's many groups online um, through uh, Facebook and other places that um, are for suicide survivors. Um, and um, this is something that you have to be at the right place for it. Um, and you might have to modify how much of the notifications you're getting, um, depending on where you're at in the healing cycle. Um, but being able to connect with other people with similar loss is very therapeutic. Yeah. And it can be really helpful to share your story with people who can honestly say they get it because um like you said lucille there is many people even within their intimate families aren't talking about it and so being able to talk about it openly honestly talking about the anger the sadness the guilt that it, there is a space to have that conversation and you can have it safely. I, I'm a member of a couple of those groups on Facebook and I've needed to pause the notifications at points when it was, I wasn't in a healthy enough place to, to see those stories coming in. Yeah. Um, but at many points over the last several years, it has been a place of, of healing for me and to be able to give support to other people who are, um, who are earlier in the healing journey than I am. It can really give some meaning and um, and just that connection that we all need. So yeah. there are lots of resources out there for people and um, it just takes the vulnerability. Maybe you're not even making any commenting and you're just watching. Just reading, <laughs> sneaking around, yes. watching what's but, going on. But, but that's helpful because you're still yeah. connecting. You're still exactly feeling mm -hmm. your story through another person's story. And um, it's and just so knowing helpful. that you're not alone, because I think, you know, exactly. if, when you feel so isolated from everyone, you think I'm the only one going through this. But when you realize there are others, then it just kind of takes some of the pain away, it takes that load off your shoulders. Yes. Diane, if people wanted to reach out to you, where can they find you? And do you do online consultations or only in person? Yes. Um, so my website is uh, drdiangrice.com. And I'm, we can put a link down uh, will, at the definitely. bottom here. And uh, my Instagram is Dr. Diane Grace. I'm on Facebook as well. Um, same, same name. <laughs> and so you can find me on those different platforms. Um, I do, uh, I'm practicing out of Arizona in person for part of the year. I am working on getting my license in uh, Washington state currently. So that will be available um, here soon. Um, but I offer telemedicine as well through uh, video and phone. And so if you're not in one of those places, I can uh, consult with you over the web. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm right. sure people will be reaching out to you after watching this episode. I mean, oh, yes. that was super interesting. And we appreciate you coming on so much and sharing so much of your personal story because, you know, like I had no idea about Luc Lucio's dad. And, and I'm sure there are so many people out there listening to this who can really resonate with your message. Yeah.
Exactly. Yeah. So this has been yes. wonderful. I think that it will, as Lynn says, it will touch a lot of people and be very, very helpful advice for them. Wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having thank me. Thank you here. so much, and Diane. Thank you for yes, coming. Yes, I would love to come back. We have a lot more we can discuss. I think we so. have a lot to cover. <laughs> Definitely. We'd love that All right. too. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, you so, much. so much. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Please be aware that Lynn and I are here to provide insights, advice, stories that are for educational and entertainment purposes only. None of our content should be considered to be personal, medical, or mental health therapy. If you are experiencing a mental health or physical health challenge, please consult the appropriate healthcare specialist. We are here to provide the best possible content in an atmosphere of positive conversation and personal growth.